Section 2.5 is about rapid PVST plus and STP operations. Let's get started with the spanning tree protocol first. The spanning tree protocol or STP is a network protocol that prevents loops in Ethernet networks by disabling redundant paths and breaking the redundant physical topology into a logical loop-free one. Spanning tree is enabled by default on all Cisco switches. Why do we need spanning tree? In a switch network, loops can cause the following. A looping frame can cause broadcast storm where it tells switches to flood broadcast frames on all ports except the incoming interface. The storm also causes another problem called MAC table instability where multiple copies of the same frame loop around and the switch receives it on multiple interfaces. And end devices receive multiple copies of the same frame. As a result, end clients may experience high CPU and critical applications may starve of resources and fail. When spanning tree is enabled on a switch, it controls the state of every switch port and places each one in either a forwarding or a blocking state. Ports in forwarding state send and receive frames and act as normal switch interface. In our examples, these ports are shown in green. Ports in blocking state do not process any frames except for spanning tree messages and do not learn MAC addresses. In the examples, these ports are shown in orange. Using this logic, spanning tree breaks the looped physical topology into a loop-free logical topology. STP performs a couple of steps to make sure that the topology is loop-free. The very first thing that the STP does is to elect a root bridge. This is the most important switch in the topology. It will be the root of the loop-free tree. Switches elect a root bridge based on a value called bridge ID. The switch that has the lowest bridge ID value is elected the root bridge of the topology. The bridge ID is composed of two different value types. The first portion is a configurable value that allows administrators to influence the root bridge election process. Lower priority values are preferred. The default value is 32768. The second part of the bridge ID value is only used when there is a tie, meaning when there are at least two switches that have the same priority value. This typically happens when all switches are left with their default values. In this case, the election process is decided by choosing the switch with the lowest system's MAC address. Let's look at this example of root bridge election. First, they exchange the first BPDU messages. Switch 2 receives two BPDU messages, one from switch 1 and one from switch 3. The BPDU from switch 1 says what the root bridge value is and compares it to its own. It is lower, so it's called a superior BPDU. When it receives the BPDU from switch 3, it compares it to the root bridge value. It is a lower value, so it's called inferior BPDU. Once switch 2 gets this inferior message, it discards it. At the end of this process, all switches within the topology must agree that there is only one root bridge, and it is the same from the perspective of each bridge. Next is root port selection, and happens immediately after the root bridge has been elected. There are three main port roles in this example. In root port selection, each non-root switch selects one root port. The root port is the port that offers the lowest path cost to the root bridge. Each switch must choose only one root port, which has the lowest cost path to reach the root bridge. What if the two paths have equal cost? Switches exchange BPDUs, which include a value called the root path cost. 
Port cost depends on the speed of the port. Faster ports have lower cost. So in case of a tie, the switch will choose the port with the lowest path cost. If the cost is the same, choose the port that received the BPD from the switch with the lowest BID. If multiple ports go to the same switch, choose the only one with the lowest port priority. If the port priority is also the same, pick the one with the lowest port number. Next is the designated port selection. On each network segment, one port is selected as the designated port. A designated port is a port that is allowed to send and receive traffic and forward BPDUs. All ports of the root bridge are designated ports because it generates configuration BPDUs. Every other non-root switch initially assumes that all its ports that are not the root port are designated ports. Sometimes, two or more switches have the same path cost. STP uses a tiebreaker system for designated ports with four rules in this order. Same with selecting a root port. Next is blocking redundant paths. Any remaining ports that are not root ports or designated ports are placed in a blocking state. Blocking ports do not forward user data but still listen for BPD use. The blocking port is also an alternative port. If the main path fails, the alternate port can quickly take over and start forwarding frames. To sum it all up, even though all three switches are still physically connected in a triangle, STP has temporarily blocked the link between switch 2 and switch 3. This prevents a loop while keeping the network fully connected. Switch 2 and 3 can still send traffic to each other, but only through switch A. Next is STP port states. STP uses specific port states to manage how switch ports behave and prevent network loops. These states, including blocking, listening, learning, forwarding, and disabled, dictate whether a port forwards traffic, learns MAC address, or remains inactive to avoid loops. Why are STP port states needed? It takes time to elect a root bridge and complete the STP process, and while the switches are figuring out the STP topology, the broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic loops around in the meantime and could cause devices to crash, leading to cycles of instabilities. This is where port states come into the picture. STP uses port states to help prevent network loops while the protocol builds the loop-free topology. STP uses a series of port states to safely transition a port into a determined STP role. When switches are powered on, ports move through several passive states while figuring out the STP topology so no temporary broadcast loops occur. Here's a breakdown of each port state. A switch port that is administratively shut down is in the disabled state. This means that it does not participate in the STP calculations at all. When a port is first initialized, it starts in the blocking state. In this state, it does not forward traffic and only receives and processes BPDUs. This allows the switch to learn the topology without causing loops. If the port is needed in the topology, it moves to the listening state. Here it still does not forward frames, but it begins sending and receiving BPDUs. This helps the switch port announce its presence and prepare to join the STP topology. Next is the learning state. In this phase, the port begins to learn MAC addresses to build its forwarding table by watching incoming frames but still does not forward traffic. The forwarding state is the active state where the port can both forward user traffic and process BPDUs. Only root ports and designated ports can reach the forwarding state. This table summarizes all spanning tree port states.
The original spanning tree protocol solved problems with loops on switch networks, but with an increasing number of users and applications connected to the network, there have been inefficiencies. First is underutilized bandwidth. When expensive links are blocked, the network becomes both inefficient and wasteful. Next is suboptimal paths. Because spanning tree blocks one of the links, traffic can't always take the shortest path, leading to increased latency and reduced performance for certain traffic. For example, voice packets are switched through a longer path and add delay and can affect call quality. Next is limited fault isolation. Since STP creates only one spanning tree for the entire network, any topology change affects all VLADs at once. For example, if a link goes down or a switch reboots, the spanning tree protocol recalculates the entire spanning tree. During this time, all VLANs experience disruption, even if they are not directly related to the affected part of the network. For exam tips, the switch with the lowest bridge ID becomes the root bridge. If you see two switches with default priority, the one with the lowest MAC address wins. You need to understand the port rules. And the root bridge has only designated ports.